Right, everyone? Wow, it's a full class today. So for the last week, when everyone is more enthusiastic again, we are going to focus on sea level change, because really, in terms of the cryosphere changing and melting away, that is really going to be what affects us in California the most, arguably, but also around the rest of the world. Uh, even people in sort of Pacific islands are going to be very, very influenced uh, by sea level change, even if they aren't influenced so much by melting of permafrost um, and lack of water supplies. So that's really our focus for today. And just sort of to, to set the, the scene, here is a map of uh, Florida um, and the south uh, eastern US. And this shows quite a large sea level change. This sh shows a six meter uh, increase in sea level. But you can see how much of our coastline would be swamped uh, by that six meter change. And you can imagine how much of our population lives along the edge of that coastline and how much of our infrastructure, things like our ports, things like uh, run, uh, airports and runways are uh, along those nice flat-lying edges. So it's a big deal, and we would like to understand more about it. So what we're going to do this week is today we're really going to look at the causes of sea level change, what we know has happened in the past, where the potential sources of significant sea level change could, could come from. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about how exactly we go about measuring sea level. What are the other things that might influence uh, how the sea level changes in a particular location? And then on Friday, we're going to talk about what we can do to deal with it. It's coming. We know it's coming. So what can we actually do to try and plan and adapt? And the ability to do that is going to very much depend on a particular country's and a region's circumstances. Here in the US, we're probably more able to deal with this. And what you'll find in discussion this week is that other countries are less able to do so. But first, how was quiz nine? A uh, couple of people said easy, some people not so much, I think. So I wanted, because we have a little bit of extra time today, I wanted to take a quick look at a couple of them that were a significant challenge. Uh, so the first one was this particular question, which asked, according to the precession cycle, which hemisphere today is experiencing a greater amount of summer ice melt compared to 11,000 years ago? Okay, so I gave you this little diagram which shows the situation today, right? So our, our Earth, so here's two I prepared earlier, they're meant to be identical. So in the top, we're going to draw the situation of the precession cycle today, which is we in our, in our northern hemisphere right now have summer when we're furthest away on our elliptical orbit. So here's the tilt of the Earth. Okay, the equator would run like this. So in the northern hemisphere, we're tilted towards the sun when we're furthest away. Okay, and the tilt stays the same throughout the year. Okay, so our winter is when we're closest to the sun, but we're pointing away from the sun. But do you remember that our precession cycle says that actually that angle on an 11,000 year time scale sort of does a little circle. So a 20,000 year time scale does a little circle. So in 11,000 years time from now, or 11,000 years ago, we would have instead been tilted this way. OK? So which hemisphere today is experiencing more summer melt than it did 11,000 years ago? The southern. So why the southern? Because the southern hemisphere today is experiencing its summer when it's closest to the sun. 11,000 years ago, or 11,000 years from now, the southern hemisphere will be experiencing summer when it's furthest from the sun. And so it'll have slightly cooler summers. Okay? We compare the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere today is having summer when it's furthest away from the sun. And 11,000 years from now, or 11,000 years ago, it will have experienced much warmer summers because it will have been closer to the sun. Does that make sense now for those people that found that tricky? Hopefully. But it wasn't the only tricky one, was it? So... 
the other ones that were commonly wrong. So this one here, which is, which is not a consequence of melting uh, glaciers around the world. So we will actually see a short-term increase in the amount of water coming off those glaciers. So we will see a short-term increase. But obviously over a long term, in 100 years or so, a lot of that ice will have gone. We'll be getting less coming off. Do you remember we had that concept of peak water, which will probably happen in the next 40, 50 years, or it's probably already happened in some places, where we, we sort of steadily increase as we melt more and more of that ice, and then at a certain point as that ice disappears, we get less and less and less stream flow again. Okay, so D was the correct answer for this one. And then I think there's only one more that was uh, caused a bit of trouble, or two more in fact. So the next one was our little lake here. So how close is it to overtopping its banks there? Not terribly close. What is the likelihood that things will fall off a slope like this? Pretty high, right? I wouldn't want to build something underneath that glacier. Okay? <laughs> something would probably fall on it and would probably fall relatively regularly. Okay, so in this case, looking at the sort of the geometry of that, where the, the lake level is relatively um, sort of low below the the circle of moraine, but it's near a really, really, really steep glacier and near really steep slopes, it's much more likely that we're going to have something sort of catastrophically falling in than it just sort of bursts by itself. If we had, if I'd given you perhaps a different image where the glacier was actually really shallowly sloping behind it, in that case, probably overfilling might be more of a likelihood. Okay? So, for those that were uncertain about that one. And then, very last one was everyone's favorite, okay, which is this one. So, why are the Andes going to experience more water shortages as a result of the loss of these glaciers, and why are they going to experience a bigger difference? Well, first of all, if you just look at the green, which shows you the precipitation, you can see that in the Alps, throughout the year, we get a certain amount of precipitation. We don't have a dry season and a wet season, okay? And so if we're talking about losing sort of uh, our extra summer water supply, which is what our glaciers are acting as, they're that extra supply in the summer, the Alps probably don't care as much because they're still getting a certain amount of precipitation. In the Andes, where otherwise they would get absolutely no water, then they actually care quite a lot. Okay, so firstly, that first answer, which was the Alps is pretty steady precipitation all year round, whereas the Andes has that dry and wet season, that's a good reason why uh, this would be the case. Um, and then also the fact that in the Alps, we get a lot of snow. So in the, the winter in the Alps, we don't really get a lot of snowfall anyway. And then in the summer, we get more, or we don't get much stream flow. And then in the summer, we do get lots of stream flow. Whereas in the Andes, we don't have that snow cover. And so we get this much steadier supply from our glaciers all year round. Okay? So if we then take away those glaciers, we'll see a really different pattern. It will instead follow precipitation. If we took away glaciers in the Alps, if there's still snow, we'd probably still see a pattern that looks more or less identical to that, where that water is stored in the winter as snow and then comes down uh, in the summer. Okay? So hopefully that is a little bit clearer now. Um, it was a bit more of a challenging quiz this week, so I wanted to go through those. So, boring admin stuff. The final evaluation is up there. Thank you for those of you for, who've already filled it in. I really do pay attention to these. So if you have something to say about how the class could be run differently that would help you learn, then please do let me know because I would love to hear from you. Um, it's open till Sunday night, so there's uh, plenty of time to do that. The class survey that counts as uh, one of your uh, days of eye clickers, if you need that, um, then that is available also till Sunday. Even if you don't need the eye clicker points, uh, we would really appreciate it if you took just a few minutes to fill it out because it really is uh, a project that we're working on to try and help improve the general education uh, science classes uh, at UCI. And so hopefully you will be benefiting, if not yourselves, than future students. That's also available until Sunday. And lastly, so we have a final. 
Not this week, next week. And it's actually not till Friday of next week, which is a really long time away, right? And so I want to know from you, when are you realistically going to study? When would realistically uh, a good time for a, a review session to be? OK? So ideally, when would you like it to be? And I'll see if I can find us a room. Okay, any more answers? Right, let's see what the winner is. Same as my other class. Um, so, so I will see if I can find us a room for Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. As a reminder, if you do want to go over anything this week, then we do have office hours, all of the TAs and me, and we'd be happy to do things. Um, and also in discussion, there should be time for any questions. Okay, great. So let's finish off what you didn't let me talk about on Friday because you're all so fidgety, which is uh, we are losing our mountain glaciers that will affect our water supply. So what can we do about this? We can't just ignore it. People need that water. There are a number of things that we can do. So if we're losing our glaciers, which used to store our water in the winter, one of the easiest things to do is build dams um, that could store that water in place of the glacier. Um, and so that can be done in some places. Uh, the problem is, is that in areas like Peru, where we have large earthquakes, um, or in countries like Bolivia, where there isn't a lot of money, then this is a really costly way of doing things. And it has to be done well. And it has to be done soon if we're going to do this, if we're going to make a difference. Things like conserving wetlands and forested areas, it seems like it should have nothing to do with our water supplies, right? But what it does do is it slows down the flow of the water away from our sort of highland areas. So more of it gets stored in groundwater, more of it gets stored in the soil, and so that becomes more available to us later in the year. Um, we just can conserve water. We're doing that pretty well in LA, apart from where we're watering enormous amounts of grass um, and landscaping. Okay, so just improving awareness and planning. Change the type of farming. So there are certain ways that we could um, change farming to be slightly less water intensive. Um, and there are sort of GM crops or genetically modified crops that do slightly better in water stressed environment. Um, and whether we can make those available to people, um, whether they would be suitable. And lastly, population with a question mark. Population is really the underlying cause of a lot of the difficulties with our environmental system. There are so many of us, okay? And so if we can address issues of overpopulation, that would be one of the easiest ways of fixing some of these problems. But of course, um, there are some significant uh, issues about how we would go about doing that and uh, whether we should do that. So let's sort of segue from, segue? Is that what the word I want to use? I don't know. Let's move from that, anyway, into uh, talking about sea level rise. Because we all say, oh, our glaciers are melting, so our sea level is going to rise. Yes. But if we meant, melted all of our mountain glaciers worldwide, we could change sea level by maybe 0.45 meters. And for those of you that aren't metric, you should be, but probably like that much. OK? So, Yes, significant, but not that much. That's if we melted everything. Okay? So in terms of sea level rise, we're not so much worried about mountain glaciers. They're definitely not helping the situation. But that's not what has us really worried. Instead, that influence on water supplies um, and flood risk, that's why we're most concerned about the melting of our mountain glaciers. So sea level rise, it is happening already. It will continue to happen. We know it, it will. The question that we have to ask is, how much and how fast? And those questions are not easy questions to answer. Um, and there are big scientific debates still about how much and how fast. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the really active research is going on. Um, and we still have a lot to learn, um, which we can hopefully do quickly. Um, because our sea level rise will again depend on 
the choices we make. So if we continue to, to burn fossil fuels and put out a lot of CO2, the world will warm a lot more, we will melt a lot more, and we will uh, also warm up our oceans, which will affect sea level. Okay? And so again, to a certain extent, our predictions at the end of the century are somewhat uncertain because of the science, but they're also uncertain because of our behavior, what will we do? Um, but in any case, we need a plan. We know it's going to happen. We need a plan to either adapt or to try and reduce the hazards associated with this. Um, so this is uh, what would happen in different parts of the world with a one meter rise in sea level. Okay? Because we like living near the coast. There are a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff. Okay? So probably 150 million people right now live within one meter of high tide level. And that will probably increase as our population continues to increase in the next century. 250 million people live within five meters of high tide. Where will they go? What will they do once they get there? Who will take them? Will we take them? We don't have the best record on immigration policy. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is that we have big important infrastructure like ports, uh, cities, uh, transport links like roads that run along our coasts. Um, and those would again uh, be potentially lost so you can see the costs and the land area. So in the gray bars there, you can see how much land area would be lost around the world due to a one meter sea level rise. And you can see that Asia and also us here in North America would be most affected by this. In terms of the population, Asia really has the most population close to sea level there. Um, and so it would be potentially, I think, up to 150 million people. In terms of the, the cost, though, in terms of the infrastructure, the GDP, again, Asia tops the list. They need to be really quite worried about this. But now Europe as well. Europe has a lot of ports and infrastructure at the coastline that, that would need to potentially be replaced. So this is not trivial amounts of money. Look at the money here. The, t the total is this, 944 billion US dollars. It's quite a lot of money. It's a lot more money than we sometimes think. So, my most obvious uh, and insulting question of the day, which of these locations is least vulnerable to sea level rise? Okay? So once you know which one it is, also try and work out where all the rest of them are. Okay, any last answers? This one should be an easy one. All right. Good, best ever answer, good. Okay, because what is E? Where is E? It's here. This is UCI. Did you not see this? Okay, so that's UCI. So we here, as you walked up here, we're uphill. We're quite a long way above sea level. We're not particularly vulnerable. We're also a pretty wealthy area, um, and so even if people are displaced, they can go somewhere. A. Does anyone know, or can anyone name a country that consists of places like A? Dubai. Sorry? Dubai. Dubai has lots of little islands. Philippines. Where else? Philippines is, has some altitude to it. Both of those have some altitude to them as well. What consists of just the countries? Who was in discussion earlier today? You should know this. Who's ever been to the Maldives? One person. It was nice, right? OK. Yeah, lots of little coral islands. Also in the Pacific, places like Tuvalu. Dot .tv, they sold that internet name and made lots and lots of money. Dot .tv. Um, and so they, they, their whole country consists of bunches of little islands like this that are maybe one meter, two and a half meters at most above sea level. They really are extremely vulnerable. Where is B? Miami. Miami. We've already talked about Miami, how uh, Miami's not going to do well. C? Anyone been to C? Venice? Absolutely. They're already not doing well with sea level change. Um, does anyone know where D is? That's a really difficult one. 
actually the coastline of Bangladesh. Okay? And Bangladesh is also another country that's going to be really in trouble because you can see, can you build walls to protect this coastline? It would be hundreds and thousands or hundreds of thousands of miles of, of uh, seawall and that's really not very practical for that particular country. Okay? So E is definitely uh, the right answer there. So what are we talking about? So if we have higher sea level, we're not just talking about on an average day it's going to be that much higher. What we really want to think about are those really very, very high tides where you get water on top of that average and also things like storm surges that come in above that. Okay? That's what sort of creates the, the difficulties. And so uh, associated with higher sea levels, we're going to have more erosion. We are going to have flo flooding of coastal regions um, and that sort of high tides and during storm surges. And also saltwater intrusion into groundwater, and that's a big one along our coast here, partly because we're taking out so much groundwater that salt water's coming in, but also just because as that sort of fresh water meets the salt water, it can sort of force its way inland. Okay? And so when we think about flooding, we're also not just thinking about the sea level. Because if you think, I have my nice sort of sea level here, when rivers come down to join the sea, they sort of come down and they join at sea level. They don't go under and pop back up again. Okay? So if we're going to increase sea level, we're also going to increase the level where our coastal uh, rivers meet the sea. And so when they flood, they're also going to uh, affect areas inland. So, a little bit of a review. Which of these images contains something that leads to the most significant sea level rise? Okay, so you have to identify the aspect of the cryosphere in each picture, and then which of them will contribute to the most significant sea level rise? Last few seconds for your votes. Right. Let's see how much you remember. Uh, sort of. OK. What am I showing you in A? Snow. OK. Does snow melt each year contribute to enormous amounts of sea level rise? No. Because what we're doing, we're evaporating it from the ocean, dumping it on land, and then each spring, most of it will melt and flow back. So we're not seeing long-term changes as a result of snow. What does B show? Sea ice. Does melting sea ice raise sea level? No. Everyone should know that from the exam, right? OK. What about C? What does C show us? Permafrost. Absolutely, permafrost. And so that's going to thaw out, but it's not going to probably contribute really significant amounts of water because there's always going to be some moisture in soils. What does D show us? Big glaciers, big ice sheets. This is the top of Greenland, and this is, shows the meltwater coming off Greenland. So D is the correct answer here. Okay. So what are our different causes of sea level rise? So we've already talked a little bit about mountain glaciers and how really they can't contribute more than maybe 0.5 meters, which is enough, really. I still wouldn't want sea level to go up by that much. We also have something called thermal expansion. Do you remember I caught you out in the very first lecture when I asked you why has our sea level mainly been rising over the past century or so? It's not, well, maybe half of it is because of melting of ice around the world, but a good half of it is because the oceans are getting warmer. And as the oceans get warmer, that water expands a little bit. And if you can do that over the whole depth of your oceans, it's going to make a difference. Then we have our big ice sheets, something we're very worried about. And then also we have groundwater. So groundwater, if you remember, is all of that water contained within the pore spaces in soils and rocks. So first of all, let's deal with thermal expansion, because I just really talked about it. But here shows a little graph of temperature along the x-axis and seawater density on the y-axis there. 
And you can see that if we increase the temperature of seawater, then that density drops. Okay? And so what that basically is saying is that that same mass occupies a larger volume. Okay? It's the same amount of mass in the oceans, but it's going to be more spread out. All of those molecules are moving around faster. Okay? And so it's not a huge amount. We're not changing it by sort of one gram per centimeter cubed or something, but we are having a slight change. So, oceanography people, I don't know where you are, so you're lucky. But tell me, where is, what is the average temperature of the oceans, do you think, of the whole oceans, not just the surface? What do you think? <coughs> Someone give me a number. 12? Lower. 7? Lower. 4? Close enough. <laughs> so the average temperature of the ocean is really cold. OK, the surface ocean isn't that cold. But actually, if we think about the, the water making up most of the deep ocean underneath that very little surface layer, most of it's really pretty cold. Okay. What about the average depth of the ocean in kilometers, because we're metric? We're scientists now. What's the average depth of our oceans, do you think? Two? Up. Ten? Down. <laughs> Five? Close enough. Four-ish. Four kilometers or so. Okay? So it's pretty close. So our average temperature of our oceans is about three degrees Celsius. The average depth of our oceans is four kilometers. And that's Four kilometers of water, we, it's difficult to imagine that. That's really deep. And so, yes, we're only changing density by a tiny amount. But if we can change that whole depth by just one degree Celsius or so, then we could actually expand our water and increase sea level worldwide by 50 centimeters again. Okay? And it's not something that anyone thinks about. Okay? And the warmer that we get, the more thermal expansion will happen. So again, it comes back to our decisions over the next uh, sort of 100 years or longer. And this isn't something that is going to sort of suddenly stop overnight. The oceans take a really long time to respond to the warming of the atmosphere that we've already seen. So even if we stopped emitting carbon today, the oceans would continue to expand uh, and, and sea level would rise for several centuries still. So let's think about groundwater. So we use that groundwater for irrigation, for drinking. What will happen to our global sea level as our groundwater usage increases? What do you think will happen to our sea level as we use more and more groundwater? You can consult your neighbor if you want. Last couple of seconds. Right, let's see. <laughs> Guess what? You didn't talk to the right person. Talk to the person behind you. See if you can get... So think about what will happen to that water. Okay, tell me again. What will happen to global sea level if groundwater usage increases? Last few seconds. So if you haven't voted, do so. Okay. So let's see if we did any better. No. <laughs> OK, so this one. So what's going to happen to all of that water being sprayed on the fields there? It's going to evaporate. What else could happen if it's just there's too much of it? It's going to run off. Where will it run off to? The ocean. <laughs> OK, there's only so many places that that water can go. If we're taking out enormous amounts of water, that is contained in that rock, which is what we are doing in large parts of uh, US and elsewhere around the world, we're then spreading that on the surface. OK, some of it might sink back in. Some of it might evaporate. Where does most of it go? It runs off. It runs into the oceans. OK? And so actually, we would see a sea level rise. OK? I'm not sure if that was the majority or not. We would see a sea level rise as our groundwater usage increases. Because how do we replenish that groundwater? We have evaporation from the ocean. It comes and we get snowfall or rain on land, and then that sinks into the ground. And if we're taking it out more quickly than that is being replaced, then that water is going to end up in the ocean. Does that make sense now? Yes? OK. So easier concept to grasp. 
if we're melting our glaciers, we're going to have more water in the oceans, okay? I didn't want to insult your intelligence with this one. And we are melting back large amounts of our mountain glaciers. But what we really want to worry about are these things. Not so much that odd little patch of ice in our mountains around the world, it's important for the local people, but what we really care about are these enormous continent-sized, two, three, four kilometer thick piles of ice. What's going to happen to those? Um, because obviously if we can melt any of these, then they could offer um, a huge amount of extra sea level rise. Okay. So it's really those, that growth and disappearance of ice sheets that has affected our sea level over the, the history of the Earth. And here you can see, going back sort of 800,000 years or so, uh, and now we have that sort of warm, so when we have high delta O18, you all know this now, we have warm periods in the ocean, so that goes sort of up towards the top. Glacial periods, when we have sort of lower delta O18, is down towards the bottom. And on this hand side, the right hand side, you can see uh, what the change in sea level is during those glacial interglacial <laughs> cycles. So at the top today, we have our sort of zero meters. We can see that if we go back maybe 20,000 years to the peak of the last ice age, then actually our sea level was probably 120 meters lower than it was today. And do you remember we talked about how that really helped the spread of humanity around the world? And then if we go back 120,000 years to the last time that global temperatures were pretty similar to today, we're back up at sort of uh, sea level close to what it is today. And in fact, it was probably somewhat higher. Okay. So during the last interglacial, 120,000 years ago, globally temperatures were probably about the same. But because of those Milankovitch cycles, the different way that they line up, the very northern uh, hemisphere up in the Arctic was probably a little bit warmer than today, maybe two or three degrees, which is a nice sort of analogy to what potentially uh, we could see in the coming decades. Um, and global sea level was probably about six meters higher than today. And we can see that by looking at shorelines around the world. We can see um, an old beach level six meters above what it is today. If we go to some of the areas with tropical corals, we can see old coral reefs that are now stranded um, that sort of date from that time. Um, and so for a very long time, we thought that it was just Greenland. If we thought, well, it's just the Arctic that's warmer. We th it must be just Greenland that lost ice. Um, and so we thought that Greenland just melted away completely and handily enough, it's pretty close to six meters of sea level equivalent. But by doing more of those sort of ice cores on Greenland, we've actually found really old ice that suggests that it can't all have been Greenland after all. And this is really quite new stuff in the last few years. And so what that means is, well, it's good news for Greenland because it means that probably there was quite a bit of ice on Greenland even in the last interglacial when it was a little bit warmer. But that extra three meters that, that makes up the difference has to come from somewhere. And so that's really bad news for parts of Antarctica because that means it's actually a lot less stable than we thought it was. It could actually contribute to sea level rise in the near future. Um, and then just as a reminder, this is the last glacial maximum. And you can see that lower sea level, especially around Florida, especially around Indonesia. And it was really only four to seven degrees colder. It's really not that much colder. Okay, but where was that extra water from the oceans? It's on those uh, on the land as those extra big ice sheets. Okay, so what happened at the end of that last ice age? So 20,000 years ago, we've had a big change and a very, very short, geologically speaking, amount of time. Um, so we've gone from 120 meters down to pretty close to sort of what we are today. And so you can see that that change happened really quite quickly. We saw a really massive increase in sea level between maybe 14,000 and maybe sort of 6,000 years. But ever since then, it's really been pretty consistent. We really melted our big ice sheets away by that time. Since then, it's been pretty constant. Um, and then what has happened since then? Well, we had this nice constant sea level. And then once we hit the 19th century, what happens? We've started to see an increase again. And that increase isn't a nice linear increase. It doesn't go just sort of a nice sort of straight line. What's happening is that that increase is accelerating. Why is it accelerating? Because the rate of warming 
has also been accelerating. Okay? And so since over the 20th century, if we take that whole 100 years and average it, then we see an increase of maybe 1.7 millimeters per year, which is really tiny. It's like that much. Okay? If we just look at, say, the past sort of 20 years or so, actually that rate's almost double. It's sort of three millimeters per year. So you can see that we really are accelerating that increase. And that may not sound like a lot, but if we add it up for the whole of the 19th century, it's probably more like that, 20 centimeters or so. And that isn't trivial amounts again for a really low-lying place. Okay. So where is our water? So I've already talked about all of the other ice caps, ice fields, and valley glaciers is equal to about a rise of 0.45 meters in the ocean. But let's take a look at some of the other ones now. So if we look at Greenland, Greenland has maybe six and a half meters of sea level rise, which is basically six of me stood on top of myself. It's a lot, okay? That would be really hard to deal with. I mean, are we talking about building seawalls six meters high around much of our coastline? It's really not hugely practical. If we start talking about Antarctica, it doesn't really matter whether it's the peninsula, the west, or the east. We're talking serious sea level rise. We're talking 70, 80 meters. We completely rewrite the face of the, the planet, really. Um, and the good news is, is that we're really not expecting Antarctica to, to melt away completely. We're worried about how much of it might melt a little bit because in even a little bit of that enormous amount of water could have quite an impact. But we're certainly not thinking about 80 meters of sea level, you'll be pleased to hear, uh, in the next few hundred years and thousands of years. So if we take a look, we've uh, tried wherever possible to actually quantify the amount of sea level rise. So we've said, well, we see maybe three millimeters per year in the most recent 20 years. What actually, if we break that three millimeters down, where is that sea level coming from? And so this table here shows you how much we think came from thermal expansion, from glaciers, from Greenland, from Antarctica. And you can see that we have estimates from 1961 to 2003, and then estimates for just the, the 93 to 2003. So it gives you the amount and then an, es an error estimate, where we think it's probably this, plus or minus this. So take a look at those numbers. Tell me, which source of sea level rise, if you look at those uh, uncertainties, which are we least certain about? Which one could be uh, more or less of a contribution? So remember, we're not looking at the biggest contribution. We're looking at the one we're least certain about. Any last answers for me? Right, let's take a look. So do you remember I said, maybe just look at the 93 to 2003. I'm not asking you which is the biggest contributor of sea level change. I'm asking if you look, which are the ones which has the biggest uncertainty? Does that help? So which has the biggest uncertainty? Which plus or minus the biggest amount? OK, so I've just basically given you the answer. So look again. Which has the largest uncertainty, plus or minus the biggest amount? And some unobserved obviously can't be your, because that's adding them all together. Okay. OK, any last answers for me? Let's see if that's any better. Not really. OK, so if we look down the list of uh, uncertainties, remember, we're not, I'm not asking you what the biggest number is, because absolutely, yes, this is the biggest contributor to sea level rise. Oh, hang on, you're right. I've done it again. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. Yes, thermal expansion is indeed the largest uncertainty. But Antarctica is also one that has a really large uncertainty associated with it. Okay? This one, at least, we know the direction of the change. 
It's 1.6, and it could be as low as 1.1. It could be as high as 2.1. If we look at Antarctica, we could be gaining mass, so we could be losing sea level change to Antarctica, or it could be contributing to sea level change. So we're really very uncertain about Antarctica too. Thank you for bearing with me. Sorry about this. Okay, so if we put our best estimates together, it's sometimes nicer to look at it as sort of a diagram rather than a list of tables, which is difficult to read. Um, so our observed sea level change is about 3.1 millimeters per year. Okay, if we put together our best estimates for those different factors, then we get pretty close. We get 2.8 or so millimeters per year, which is actually pretty good given those sort of large ranges of uncertainty. And you can see how much of that in that orange part of the column there is due to thermal expansion. Really, at least half of it is just because the oceans are getting warmer, even if we take out the effect of melting ice. And then, above that ocean thermal expansion, we have the contribution of glaciers and ice caps. So even if they don't contain that much water right now, they are what is melting and, and contributing to sea level change. They can't alter sea level hugely, but they are right now at least having quite a big impact. And then at the top, we have Antarctica and Greenland, which contain a huge amount of possible sea level change, but at least right now, don't seem to be contributing that much. But obviously the concern is, is that going to continue? So in, in our case of thermal expansion, our oceans are warmed by 0.1 degrees Celsius or so, and they're definitely absorbing a huge amount of that warming, over 80% or so, they're really s saving us from ourselves. But there is a significant time lag. You can't instantly heat four kilometers of ocean. Okay, it's going to take a while for them uh, to match up with the atmosphere. And so, as I said, even if we stop increasing temperatures today, our oceans will continue to rise um, for, for centuries to come. So this is a really lovely little graph. I like this a lot. In the white column, you can see basically how much water is contained in our small glaciers and ice caps, Greenland and Antarctica. So obviously you can see the difference between Greenland and Antarctica here in terms of its size. The red column though shows how much of the current amount of sea level rise we're seeing is a result of those. Okay, so again, just like I said before, our small glaciers and ice caps don't contain much water, but right now they are losing that water really quickly because they tend to be in warmer areas. Whereas Greenland and Antarctica, especially Antarctica, contain a massive, massive amount of water. But right now, we don't think it's changing that much. But we are concerned about what might happen to those. And so we want to understand a little bit more about them. So here are our culprits, Greenland and Antarctica, just in case you had forgotten. And remember, this is not to scale. Antarctica is really huge. It's about the same size as the US and Mexico combined. Um, all with sort of three kilometers of ice on top of it. Um, and remember that these have ice shelves around the edge, and those ice shelves are still attached to the, the ice on land, but they are floating. So melting of the ice shelves themselves doesn't raise sea level. But obviously, as we lose those, more ice can escape from uh, on land. So let's think about this. I like this diagram a lot. It shows Greenland on the left and conditions on Antarctica on the right. Okay? And in the, the, sort of the green shows where we're accumulating. And on Greenland, that accumulation is really only happening very much at the top, high up on the ice sheet. On Antarctica, that accumulation is really happening over the whole of the surface. And that's because Greenland is a little further south. It just tends to be a little bit warmer because of uh, the, the ocean currents and atmosphere around it. Whereas Antarctica is really, really, really cold. Doesn't really get warm enough to melt um, near the surface very often. So where is Greenland losing ice? Where are we getting ablation? Greenland is losing ice actually from the ice sheet itself. We're sort of seeing melting at the very edges and also a certain amount of carving. But remember that Greenland is really surrounded on most sides by mountains. There's only a very few places where ocean temperatures can get to the ice. Whereas on Antarctica, really what matters in Antarctica is what our ocean temperatures are doing. 
because it's always cold enough at the surface that we're not really going to get much melting. But underneath, if that water warms just a little bit, we could see significant amounts of ice melt uh, underneath there. So Greenland is mainly being affected by air temperatures right now, and perhaps a little bit by ocean temperatures. Antarctica is really mainly being affected by our increasing ocean temperatures. So before we talk more about them on Wednesday, I wanted to introduce you to the Greenland ice sheet uh, again. It's 1.7 square or million square kilometers. It's about two kilometers thick, so not as thick as Antarctica. And the ice is maybe up to 110,000 years, maybe a little bit older than that. It's a very different beast. And what would uh, Greenland look like if we took away the ice? It would look like that. So I have a question for you. The middle of Greenland there is underwater if we took all of the ice off it instantly. Can we form glaciers on something that's underwater? What are glaciers? They're ice on land. We can't form glaciers if they're underwater, right? So why is the center of Greenland underwater? Does anyone want to take a guess? It's a mystery. So if we think about the Earth's crust, if I pile lots and lots of weight on the Earth's crust, what might happen to the Earth's crust? It might do that. Yeah, might bend downwards. That's what's happened. Greenland, it's got two kilometers of ice on top of it. It's actually developed so much mass that actually the crust, the Earth's crust, has bent down a little bit. Okay? And so the center of Greenland, if we instantly took off all that ice, it would be underwater. Okay? This is going to be important for, for Friday. If we look at Antarctica, we can do the same sort of thing. We can say, well, this is of the, the shape of the ice surface, and this is how thick or how high our ice is. If we can then work out where the bedrock is, Antarctica would look a bit like this. So blue, again, is underwater. And how much underwater? Some parts of it are two and a half kilometers underwater. Okay? And that shows you how much mass is on Antarctica again pushing it down, okay? And so you can see that we do also have areas of sort of high uh, mountains in Antarctica, but a lot of it, sit still for a second. I only have one more minute, I promise. But a lot of it, especially this western side. So often, do you remember on the tables that I showed you, it split Antarctica into west versus east? Why is that? Because if we look at the eastern side, a lot of that ice is sat above sea level still. And that means that it's much more stable. In the western side, much of that ice is sat below sea level. If we warm our oceans up a little bit, if we can get water attacking the base of that ice, we're really worried about how stable it might be over longer time scales. So that's why it's important to know the difference. OK, great. I'll see you on Wednesday for more sea level change.